So we're making our way through the heart. We came into the right atrium. What color is the blood in the right atrium? Blue. How did that blood get into the right atrium? What two vessels? The vena cava. The vena cava, superior and inferior. The only way to get there. We go from the atrium into the ventricle, and we're still on the right side. And what valve do we pass through? Tricuspid valve. It only has that one name. The other side's got two names, but this one's only got the one name, tricuspid valve. Now, in the right ventricle, what color is our blood still? Blue. Blue. It's deoxygenated blood still. And now we're in the ventricle on the right side. This is the pump. The atria, they don't have really a whole lot of muscle. They're pretty thin. Because the atria only have to pump blood from the atria to the ventricles down. And we're going to see that really 80% of that blood is just going to drop. It's not going to be pumped. It's going to be sucked down, excuse me, by the ventricle. So only 20% of the volume of blood in the atria has to be contracted and pushed down. So that muscle is really thin. But when we get to the ventricles, that's where we're going to have thick walls of muscle because the right side, the right ventricle, where does it have to pump the blood to? Pulmonary artery, the rest of the body. It, it, on the right side, we're pumping it into the pulmonary trunk, which we're going to get to. And where is it going? It's going to the lungs, which is just laterally. But we have to pump with enough, enough force from the right ventricle to go to the lungs and back to the heart. But again, that's just like going, hint, hint. it's not a whole lot of work, right? Hint, 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 hint. So that's what's happening on the right side. Now, when you look at the illustration, we've got our cusps. We've got our big bundles of muscles that are attached to the cusp. What are those muscles called? Papillary, papillary muscles. They look like fingers or papillae. And what connects the papillary muscles to the cusps? Chordae tendinae. We're just kind of reviewing some stuff from last time. But when you look at the wall of our ventricle, it's going to be really rough. It's got ridges and depressions. The ridges that you have there, these muscular ridges, are called trabeculae. And someone somewhere looked at it and said, wow, this looks really meaty. I don't know if they were hungry when they saw that or what, but trabeculae carne are these ridges that look meaty. And these serve a purpose. Because when the ventricle contracts and pumps, it's moving the blood. Now, how many of you remember looking at history books, or maybe you read Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, the steamboats on the Mississippi River? What's another name for those steamboats? What did they have that moved the boat? The paddle wheel. You remember those, those big paddle wheels? If you just had a smooth, round cylinder on the back of that boat, is that boat going to go anywhere? No, there's nothing to push against the water. So these trabeculae are like the paddles on a paddle boat that are going to help move the blood in the right direction. And when we get to the conduction and heartbeat, we're going to see what that direction is. Now that's similar to what we have, the rough surface we have in the atria. What was that rough muscular surface in the atria? What do we call that muscle? Starts with a P. Pectinate muscle. But in the atria, it's much smaller. So they give them a completely different name. All right, so now we're in the ventricle. We're going to contract. And when the ventricle contracts, it's going to force the blood out. And the blood can go the easiest path possible. But the blood can't go back into the right atrium, can it? No. What's preventing that? The well, that's part of the, the tricuspid valves that are attached to the papillary muscles via the chordae tendinae. The tricuspid valves are atrioventricular valve on the right side, 
prevents blood from going backwards. So it can't get out that way. The only path for blood in the right ventricle to go is the pulmonary trunk because we've got to go to the lungs. And so when we get contraction, and again, that is referred to as systole, when you have ventricular systole, that contraction, blood is forced upward, can't go into the atrium, so the only way to get out is through the pulmonary trunk. But we have a set of unidirectional valves at the beginning of the pulmonary trunk. These are our pulmonary semilunar valves. Are those valves regulating blood and its ability to get out of the ventricle? No. Because when the blood is pushed upward, the cusps of our semilunar valves are pushed against the wall of the vessel and it's just an open circuit up. These are going to come into play when the ventricle relaxes. And what is that term for relaxation? Starts with a D. Diastole. 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 So ventricular diastole, when it relaxes and expands, all the blood's gone. And you're going to have a vacuum created and that blood's going to want to fall back down into the ventricle. That's when these valves close to prevent blood moving back into the ventricle and it stays in the pulmonary trunk and pulmonary artery. Now when that blood fills those cusps and they close, you're going to get a sound. Remember when the AV valves closed, that was your S1, the lub of the heartbeat, now, when the semilunar valves, and they're both going to do it at the same time, the pulmonary and the aortic, when they close at the same time, you get the second sound of the heartbeat called the dub. Lub-dub, lub-dub, lub-dub. Those are your heartbeat sounds, and we know they all come from our valves. What occurs at the same time as the S2? All, see, we've got our pulmonary semilunar valve here, and the aortic semilunar valve is back behind it. We can't see it but both the semilunar valves close at the same time. Both of the atrioventricular valves close at the same time. So both the same close at the same time? Uh, basically, we're moving blood from the both atria and both ventricles at the same time. It's not one side versus the other, it's chambers. So that's, that's a good point. Now, notice I say pockets for cusps. These are shaped a little bit differently than what we see with our atrioventricular valves. Now here, we're look, we're, it's as if we're in the atria looking downward. Here we have our tricuspid valve. Which side would that be on? Tricuspid valve? Right. Right side. Here we have the bicuspid valve. This kind of looks like two lips, like a mouth. This is different because it's got the three. These are our semilunar valves, and it kind of reminds me of a peace sign, the old 70s peace sign. You can see that, or in this case, that's kind of like a letter Y. But these are the pockets of our semilunar valves. This one is closed. This one is kind of open, but do you see how that flap, that flap of the cusp is pushed toward the side? This one's completely pushed away. So when the blood is up here, trying to fall back into the ventricle, it inflates those and they snap shut, giving the S2 sound. I look at them like pockets on your pants. If the ventricle is down towards your foot and your blood vessels are up here, are you ever going to get your hand into your pocket, moving your hand up your leg? No, this is blood coming out of the ventricles during systole. But now, the blood is up here in the blood vessel, and it's going to be sucked downward toward the ventricle. Now I move my hand down, it's going to go in the pocket and fill that pocket. It's just we have three of them around that opening, and that closes it off to prevent the backward flow of blood. And both, both have the same architecture. The, the AV valves are a little bit different, but the semilunar valves look the same. Do you have a question? Now, the one other thing I, I want to point out 
<coughs> when you look at this picture. Notice we've got our three cusps over here. We know that's the right side. And where did we say it's pumping blood? The right, the right ventricle? To the lungs. Not that far, right? So when you look at the muscular wall of the right ventricle, you're going to see that it's pretty thin. <coughs> Excuse me. Compared to the thicker left ventricle. Now when we get down into the ventricle even further, you're going to see it's much, much, much thicker. Because if you see an individual in the gym that works out a lot, versus an individual that just walked in off the streets and hasn't done anything but eat potato chips, who's going to have the bigger muscle? The one that works out all the time, the one that's lifting the heavier weight. So the right ventricle, we already said, just kind of goes, hink, 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 moving to, and to the lungs and back to the heart. Where does the left ventricle have to pump blood? The left ventricle has to pump blood to the big toe and back to the heart against gravity. Left ventricle is doing more work. The thickness of that muscular wall is going to be greater on the left side. So just by looking at dissected ventricle, you could tell the thickness of the wall, which is right versus which is left. So do taller people have thicker uh, left ventricle muscle walls? Who do taller people? I would, I would say yes. Now, their heart's also going to be bigger because they're bigger in statue, so uh, I don't know how much thicker. You, your heart starts to get too thick, especially if the right ventricle gets too thick because you've got blood pressure issues, you've got oxygen issues. Now, now you're getting cardiomyopathy, and that's a bad thing. All right, so it, that, you know, building muscles in the gym is one thing, but heart muscle, not so much. Okay? All right, so we said that the valves close S2 during uh, diastole, when we're relaxed. And during systole, they're forced open as the blood's pushed out. When we leave the right ventricle, we go past those semilunar valves, the pulmonary trunk, and then we come to a T intersection. We got to go either right or left. There's no straight. Half of the blood's going to the lung on the right side, half's going to the blood, the lung on the left. Those then are the pulmonary arteries. And what color is that blood? Careful, it's a trick question. Pulmonary arteries, the blood is what color? Blue. Blue. Arteries typically are what color blood? Oh, red. red, but which direction are we moving? away from the heart. This is that pulmonary circuit where the color of the blood is different than what it typically is in the systemic circulation. So we're still playing with moving deoxygenated blue blood even though they're called arteries because it's moving away from the heart. So here, here's a synopsis of what we've done so far on the right side. So I've included this in here if you want to kind of use this to study. Here's our deoxygenated blood coming in the vena cava, right atrium. TV, what does that stand for? Tricuspid valve, right ventricle. PV, pulmonary valve, that's our semilunars. So you could put PSV if you wanted to do that, semilunar valves. Now, they're saying pulmonary aorta for that one. Pulmonary trunk, pulmonary aorta, same thing. And then we get to our pulmonary arteries, which this artist didn't do a very good job. One looks really dinky and one looks bigger. They're equal in, in diameter. Okay? And now we're going to look at the left side. Because we've gotten to the lungs, we've given off the carbon dioxide, we've loaded up on oxygen, and what kind of respiration do we call that that happens in the lungs? External. External respiration. I'm repeating these things over and over that often get confused, and I don't want that to happen to you. The gas exchange inside the lungs is called external respiration because gases are being exchanged with the blood 
and the air that's inside the lung that's the same as the air in the external environment. We just brought it into the lungs. Hugh, do you have a question? Yes, sir. Um, so are the pulmonary arteries, <coughs> arteries all the way to the lungs and then back again, or do they transition at some point in between? Mm. What do we got here? Because where are we going? From the lungs, From the lungs. To, the to the heart. Yeah. So now we load up on oxygen. So what color is our blood? Red. red. And we're coming back to the heart. So we're red blood being transported in what vessels? Veins. Pulmonary veins. And again, it's the pulmonary circuit. So it's backwards. Just keep that in mind. So now we've got that red blood in four large vessels coming into the left atrium. And that's where we're going to deposit the blood in the left atrium. Yeah? All the arteries in the pulmonary circuit. So all arteries in the pulmonary circuit, which there's just two are deoxygenated, so yes, they're blue. All veins, four in the pulmonary circuit, carry oxygenated blood in their red. So the arteries and veins that are pulmonary are backwards from the systemic circulation that we're used to, red blood in arteries, blue blood in veins, pulmonary is opposite. Okay? <clears throat> All right, now, the left side of the heart from here because we're coming into the left atrium, it's basically the same as we have on the right side. There's just a couple of exceptions, naming exceptions that we're going to point out. We've got oxygenated blood coming from the lungs. Our atrioventricular valve has two cusps, so it's the bicuspid. Another name for it is the mitral valve. That's going to make sure blood does not go backward from the ventricle to the atrium. Again, remember when your AV valves close, that's the lub, S1. So this, this along with our tricuspid, make the S1 sound. To get us to the left ventricle, we've already talked about much thicker wall because it has to do more work. Then we have our semilunar valves. These are going to the aorta because it's called the aortic semilunar valve. Those close at the same time the pulmonary semilunars to give you the S2 sound. So the only difference right to left are the names of our AV valve and the added name here for our semilunar. That's the difference. And then where we go. Pulmonary trunk goes to the lungs. Aorta goes everywhere. Blood's going to go back to the heart and our coronary. Blood's going to go back to the lungs to supply our lung tissue with oxygenated blood. So it literally goes everywhere, coming out of the aorta. <clears throat> the atrioventricular valves, the tricuspid and bicuspid, are the same structure, cusps chordae tendinae, and papillary muscles. Okay. The, they're the same build. The semilunar valves, either the pulmonary or the aortic, are the same build with those three pockets around each. Oh, that was a silly question. That's okay. No, it's no such thing as a silly question. Unless I ask it, then it's probably silly. All right, so again, here is our synopsis, looking at the flow of blood. Remember, we're coming out going to the lungs, and here we're coming back from the lungs. And then aorta, we're going out to the body. If, if, this doesn't, if this is not helpful, necessary studying, this is another illustration. Uh, however you want to look at it, if it helps you, great. If you find something else, great. Whatever works for you. I try to present as many different ways as possible because not everyone learns the same way. All right? Any questions at this point? All right, that's kind of the flow of blood through the heart. Okay, so like this may be too big of a question, but just for the future. But so when we're listening to the love, like the heart sounds. Uh huh. So the S one is two valves, 
at the same time in the S2 is two valves at the same time. Correct. As well. So which like could you tell me like which uh, two valves they are again? So the first S1, the lub, are the atrioventricular valves, tricuspid, bicuspid. The dub, the second sound, S2, are both of the semilunars, the pulmonary and the aortic. So when you are listening to the heartbeat, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, the lub is S1, the dub is S2. So is there any difference in the, how those two, like, uh, how those groups of valves are innervated by the sign of atrial node? They're not. They're not? No. These, these, the valves, the cusps, the semilunars, they're just coll collagenous tissue. The chordae tendine is collagenous tissue. The papillary muscle is going to be triggered basically by the beating of the heart. So that's the only thing that's really contracting and pulling. Oh, so, so that's how you know it works on one thing, which affects everything. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And we're going to get to how the conduction and stuff works. There's, there's going to be some overlap in the open okay. part, but it's the closing that makes the sound. Okay. And we're going to get to the cardiac cycle. We may not reach it today, but the cardiac cycle is going to go through exactly those, those points. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So what is, <laughs> it's not a pleasant thing to talk about, right? Yeah. Regurgitation. Uh, when you think of regurgitation, what do you think of? Stuff going in the wrong direction, yeah. right? Your stomach contents are not supposed to go that way. That's regurgitation. So mitral valve regurgitation, and, and really when you hear mitral valve from a cardiologist, typically you're going to hear mitral valve prolapse. That's what allows the blood to go backwards, to go the wrong direction from the ventricle back into the atria. And with mitral valve, we're talking the left side. So the mitral valve prolapse where when the valves close and, and prevent the blood from going backwards, the mitral valve maybe goes too far up and it doesn't seal and the blood goes backward, regurgitates past that valve. Then depending on the severity of it, you may have to have a valve replacement surgery if, if the leak is big enough. That will give you a heart murmur, yeah. And you'll be set up for an echocardiogram and they can do the Doppler and see the blood that's going backwards and moving. I think, I don't know the state of the art with artificial valves, but I do know they still use bovine valves, pig valves, to replace some of that valve tissue. Can that be a problem for like bubble wrap as well? I beg your pardon? I have no clue what bundle branch block is. I'm kind of the basic science side. I know a little bit about the clinical stuff, especially if it's happened to me. Um, but I would have to look into what that is. That's, and I, I will do that for next time. Oh, cool. Yeah, I, I will have to Google that one and find out bundle, bundle branch block. That sounds like a conduction thing. Yes, it is. So we'll talk about the AV bundle here in just a little bit. How do they keep someone alive when they cut into their heart to replace a valve? How, how do you keep someone alive when you have to stop their heart to do the surgeries? Just for, like, mm. the blood. They are hooked up to a heart-lung machine. This machine circulates your blood around your heart. It artificially pumps your blood, and it's oxygenating the blood for you because you're not really ventilating all that much during that process. Is that what a so, is? Sorry? Is that what a ventilator is? No, no, it's not a ventilator. A ventilator just breathes for you. This is your artificial heart that's a pretty big unit. So it's, no, I can't imagine the first one. I, I don't want to volunteer for that. Uh, not sure if you found this yet, but I posted in the news on D2L. It's a video that walks you through using those illustrations, the flow of blood through the heart. It's about an eight, eight and a half minute video. If it helps you, great. If not, there's a lot of stuff about the heartbeat on there. Now, that's the anatomy and the flow of blood. How does the heart know to contract? And this is some pretty cool stuff. 
So we're going to talk about the electrical excitation of the heartbeat and the muscular contraction, and then how do we control and regulate the rate of that beat. It's two separate things. So first, when we look at our illustration of the conduction system of the heart, there are a couple of things to point out. We are going to have a very specific point at which we initiate the heartbeat. I think we talked about the metronome already in here. So the cardiac metronome is going to be right up here in our right atrium. And it's going to be these cells that signal for the heartbeat. And those electrical signals are going to spread through the cardiac muscle cells. Now we're starting it at one spot. So especially here in our atria, we don't see a lot of this wiring and the cabling. How, think back to ANP1, how does the electrical signal spread from one point through all of the connected cardiac muscle cells? Mm, not, not, not the chain, that's more by respiration. Hmm? It's the action potential, but how does it get from one cell to the next? What's the junction that connects our cardiac muscle cells together? Do you remember some kind of disc? Intercalated disc? Okay, it's like a Z disc, but it's an intercalated disc. It's the junction between our cardiac muscle cells. And inside that intercalated disc, there are adhesion type junctions to keep them from pulling apart, but there are other junctions that allow the cytoplasm to be continuous one cell to another. Do you remember what those were called? Gap junctions. Gap junctions. So when one cell undergoes an action potential, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, you're not away from it. When you initiate an action potential, think back to neurons, you open a voltage-gated sodium channel. Which direction is sodium going to go? it's going to flow into the cell. When sodium flows into the cell, where does it go? Everywhere. And with cardiac muscle cells, it's going to flow into that one cell, and as it spreads, it's going to go through the gap junction into the next cell. That will be enough to depolarize it. Sodium comes in, goes through. Do you see what happens? It's a chain reaction that happens all at once, and you only have to signal in one specific place because as soon as you signal for one, they're all going to do it because of the gap junctions. They're all connected through the gap junctions into a single functional unit that's interconnected with all of these parts. It's called a syncytium. And that's, that's a key point to remember as we go through this. Now, is it true, because I, I heard this from paramedics, that if your SA, like something's wrong with your natural pacemaker, the next cell over will act as like a pacemaker and take on that role. I don't know that to be fact. Okay. I think if that were the case, then why do we have artificial pacemakers in, put in people every day? Well, just, they, I, don't, they, I don't know how effectively that would be. So, so the SA is where the action potential starts in the heart. So we're going to get there. Okay. All right. So the sinoatrial node, a.k.a. the SA node or the pacemaker, it is located, as, I, as we see in the illustration, in the right atrium. It's because the sinoatrial node is the pacemaker. When you're looking at a patient's normal EKG, or I think ECG now, when you look at just that normal rhythm, have you ever heard it called a sinus rhythm? Yep. Sinus rhythm. Sinus because it's initiated from the sinoatrial node. Now, going through all of my time in biology, especially early on in anatomy, I always wondered, what in the heck do your sinuses have to do with your heart rhythm? Because the sin all the sinuses I knew were in my nose. What does sinus have to do with anything? I'm going to answer that for you 
because you're lucky that your instructor is an embryologist as well because that's where it comes from. Early on when you were an embryo, this is what your heart looked like. Your blood entered into the single primitive atrium. Before it gets there, it has to go into this little bag that receives the blood. What is the name of that little bag? The sinus venosus. Your pacemaker activity was first present in the sinus venosus when you were an embryo. But notice your, your heart tube gets bigger, it starts to bend, it starts to loop, and it ends up looking really weird like this. This single ventricle is going to turn into both your ventricles. Your atrial tissue in blue is going to become both of your atria, but notice this blue tissue that was the sinus venosus, it gets recycled and incorporated into the wall of your right atrium. And in fact, that pectinate muscle, the rough surface in your right atrium, if you look in the right atrium, there's also a smooth patch. That smooth patch is the former sinus venosus that got incorporated, and that's where you can find the sino from the sinus venosus atrial, now you're in the right atrium, node. So that is where we get sinus rhythm from, the precursor embryonic tissue that gave rise to the location of your current SA node. Yeah? Yes. Because you're going to impress people when you're out in the clinics. Sinus rhythm and you go, hey, where'd that come from? Nobody's going to know, but you now, don't shame the doctor. That probably wouldn't be a good thing, okay? But the doctor is probably not going to remember that. Yeah? Can you go back one slide? Back one slide. Now, again, I'm going to post these in the video because I haven't yet put that together. Any questions about that? Again, this is one of the reasons why I love studying embryonic cardiology because the heart is absolutely an amazing organ. Amazing. It's moving blood when it looks like this. And it ends up with your current adult four chambered amazing organ. Another name for the sinatrial node is the sinus rhythm? No, no, no. The sinoatrial node is a pacemaker, the SA node. The sinus rhythm is your normal ECG rhythm. Okay. And the sinoatrial node dictates that normal rhythm if everything's going good. Okay? So we've got the sinoatrial node that's going to initiate the signal. Here in the atrium, down towards the bottom of the right atrium, we have another collection of these conductive cells that's called the atrioventricular node just because of its location. This one, you may think, well, the pacemaker's really important. This one probably not so important. Eh, it's pretty important too. And we're going to talk about the function of what's going on here with this in just a minute. Right now we're just putting the anatomy together. But this is going to pick up the depolarization, the electrical signal initiated by the sinoatrial node, transferred through all of the cardiac muscle of the atrium. It's going to pick it up here and it is going to relay it down these fibers to the ventricle. Now we don't have a relay up in the atrium, do we? No, we've got the gap junctions. Right? So why, why do we need a relay of fibers going from the atrium to the ventricles? That's a possibility. The impulse not strong enough? I mean, that's, that's a good hypothesis. Because the muscle's so dense. Actually, it's just the opposite. The muscle's so dense. It's kind of the opposite. Think about that one. Think about that. We're going to get to it in the conduction as we follow the path. So, again, we said the action potential is going to start in the sinoatrial node. It's going to spread, and both atria are going to get excited at the same time, and both atria are going to contract at the same time. They're going to push open the AV valves. Well, the AV valves are going to open, and that blood's going to drop at the same time. And then these are going to contract and squeeze that last 20% down into the ventricles. 
But that action potential is going to hit the AV node at the same time it hits all of our atrial cells, but the AV node is going to pause the signal for a short period of time. Now part of it is because we don't have as many gap junctions, so it's not spreading as quickly, and there's going to be a tenth of a second pause. That doesn't sound like a lot, does it? A, t a tenth of a second. How is that significant? Your complete cardiac cycle is eight tenths of a second long. So it's more than 10% of your cardiac cycle in this pause. But this pause is important because what the pause does, it allows the atria to undergo systole and squeeze that last 20% of blood into the ventricles before the ventricles contract. So that pause from the AV node is critical to the proper functioning of the heart. It's also why you hear the lub dub instead of just hearing one sound. Because if you didn't have the pause, both valves, I guess, would close at the same time. And it really wouldn't be effective. So that pause is a critical from the AV node. Now, from the AV node, we've got this interconnected bundle of conductive fibers. They're like modified cardiac muscle. They don't contract, but they can still conduct the action potential, just like the cardiac muscle cells do. And this atrioventricular bundle comes down into the septum that divides the left and the right ventricle from each other, this wall. And that is called the atrioventricular bundle, or you may hear it as the bundle of Hiss. I think Dr. Hiss identified this thing. And that conduction is going to go down and it's going to curve up from the apex of the ventricle. And from the apex of the ventricles, we're going to have these fibers that go up the wall, and these are called Purkinje fibers. I think that's on the next slide. But you remember I asked the question, why don't we have a bundle of fibers in the atrium, but we've got this bundle of fibers going to the ventricle? We talked about density of muscle. We talked about strength of signal. There is some connective tissue that is called the annulus fibrosis. It's the skeleton that supports our valves, and it essentially occupies this space separating the atria and the ventricles. They call it the cardiac skeleton. This connective tissue is not cardiac muscle. This connective tissue doesn't have gap junctions. So it, in effect, the annulus fibrosis, in addition to being the structural component that the valves are hanging on to, it insulates the atria separately from the ventricles. So the only way to get the electrical signal from the atria to the ventricles is picking it up with the AV node pausing and then relaying it through the bundle of Hiss and releasing it into the ventricles. That's how the signal spreads. Annulus fibrosis occupies what space? Again? So if we have cut off the atria, okay. and so this is the atrioventricular region we're looking down on. Here we have our tricuspid valve, our bicuspid, and our semilunar valves. Essentially, this blue, these blue rings that you see, that's the annulus, which means ring, fibrosis, fibers, connective tissue, and that functionally separates the atria from the ventricles because there's no gap junctions. The signal can't just spontaneously spread from the atria to the ventricles. So you have to have that bundle of Hiss, the AV bundle, to relay the signal through the annulus fibrosis and release it down at the apex or the base of the ventricles. And then our Purkinje fibers go up the wall. And basically what happens is this signal gets sent down to the apex, the point at the bottom of the heart. And it's down at that apex where you start the spreading of the Purkinje fibers that the contraction begins at the bottom and moves as a wave up. 
And that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Because where does the blood have to go? It's got to go up. So the heart, if this is the apex where I'm putting my hands together, the heart contracts in a wave-like pattern from bottom up. Okay, let me see a show of hands. How many people are toothpaste tube rollers? You know what I'm talking about? You roll that tube up from the bottom. Okay, how many of you are grabbing squeezers? I'm a grabbing squeezer. Now, I, no, I, see, I'm both. Well, no, I'm not. I am a grabbing squeezer, and then I get the handle of the toothbrush and squeegee until I get just a little taste on. Anybody else? Yeah. You roll because that's one way to get, to, stop it, to get all of the toothpaste out. So when the heart does that from bottom up, it's like rolling that toothpaste tube to get all the blood out. And what's helping move all the blood from bottom to top? Not just the point of the contraction, but the trabeculae carnae, the paddles, are helping make sure to move the blood up. So no, getting the blood out from the ventricle, that's just the force of the heart having all that blood inside and it contracting that puts more pressure on the blood. It's got to squirt somewhere and it squirts out. It's what? I'm not going to answer that question because I'm being recorded. Okay. <laughs> so we talked about sinoatrial node. The signal spreads through the atrial cells, the gap junctions, picked up by the AV node. That goes through the AV bundles down to the Purkinje fibers. And that is what signals the action potentials to cause all those cardiac muscle cells to contract. The atria first because of the SA node, the ventricles second, depending on where you start your cardiac cycle, because of the pause of the AV node before the signal is relayed. We don't want them all four contracting at the same time. And that's, that's what that slide says. All right. So we, we talked about the anatomy, we've talked about the conduction system, we've talked about how the conduction system relates to the contraction. Now we've got to talk about the action potential itself because it's a little different than what we saw with neurons. But this illustration is trying to show you the electrical signal and how it's relayed from the SA node to the AV node, down the AV bundle. I, I don't necessarily like all these interconnected loops that you see. It almost makes it look like you've got a loop connecting one to the other. And in fact, you can have some of these aberrant conductive pathways that can lead to certain arrhythmias. And when we get to arrhythmias, we'll talk about that on Thursday, there's gonna be one that my son, who's a soldier in the Army in Okinawa, Japan, he had this wolf parkinson white syndrome, and it was an aberrant signaling, and they actually had to go in and cauterize certain areas of his heart. I am happy to report to my people from last semester, he is completely off his physical limitations. No, no more issues whatsoever. I don't think he thinks it's a good thing because he's got to do PT again. Do you remember this from AP1? This is, what are you growling about? <laughs> this is what our action potential look like in neurons. Resting membrane potential. We had to reach a threshold of minus 55. What two things happen at minus 55? Depolarization and what caused, what had to open to get depolarization? Voltage gated sodium channels had to open that leads to a change in our membrane potential because sodium ions come flooding in. Those inactivate quickly, but then voltage-gated potassium ions open, potassium goes out, repolarize, hyperpolarization, and we get back to our resting state because of sodium-potassium pumps. That's a quick, quick, quick review from last semester. 
Cardiac muscle cells do things a little differently. Starting with the SA node cells, they do things differently. To get an action potential, what did you have to have? You had to have a stimulus, some kind of stimulus to get your nerves to fire. Well, your sinoatrial node cells, your pacemaker cells, have a built-in automatic depolarization. It's like the metronome. Once you start it, it doesn't stop. Sometimes I have nightmares that it will never stop. But your sinoatrial node, you never want it to stop, right? If your sinoatrial node stops, in the ER you're going to hear, that's not, that, no, mm, that's not a good sign. So when we look at the, the action potential with our sinoatrial node cells, the depolarization is what? What is that word? Spontaneous. It's going to automatically happen. And this is going to happen during that period of hyperpolarization. In our SA node cells, it's going to begin about minus 60 millivolts. And this happens, remember, after your previous repolarization stage. It goes a little too negative. Once you get down into this negative range, you have these channels that are going to open. They are called, big fancy name, HCN, hyperpolarization for the H, cyclic nucleotide channels. Here's, here's the, the take home message. These channels are going to allow a lot of sodium to come in. What does that sound like? When a lot of sodium comes in, that sounds like depolarization. Some potassium comes, uh, leaves out, but mostly sodium comes in. So when the HCN channels open, now all of a sudden we start moving back towards minus 40 millivolts. Boom. That is our built-in stimulus that then causes diastolic depolarization in our sinoatrial node cells. But what usually causes depolarization in our neurons? Voltage gated what channels? Sodium channels. Well, we just did sodium here. So we can't use sodium again. We need another positive ion. And so the diastolic depolarization in our SA node cells are voltage gated. Well, there's our friend again, calcium voltage-gated calcium channels, and calcium floods in. So let's follow what's happening with our SA node. Here we have our repolarization from a previous action potential, right? So we start getting down in this range, all of a sudden, boom, HCN channels open. Sodium comes in. Do you see that little slope right there? That's called our pacemaker potential. And as soon as we get to that 40 millivolts or so, the voltage-gated calcium channels open, bam, what do we call that going up? That's D, depolarization. We use a different ion, but that's still depolarization. We call that diastolic depolarization. And then we get here, calcium channels open, we repolarize, but guess what? We can't be happy, we can't take a break. Boom, HCN, pacemaker potential open voltage gated calcium channels, and that happens your entire life. So when we're in the embryo, what actually starts our first sinoatrial? Oh, heavens, what starts the very first? Yeah. I don't know. I, I have no idea. Okay. I, it just does. Yeah. <laughs> the red portion of the line is also depolarization, but it's a different... This, yes. this is more of a stimulus. This is more of a stimulus, but it's a spontaneous stimulus that's going to happen over and over and over and over and over again. Now, the way when we get, we're not going to really look at it. We're going to talk about how to change the rate with our parasympathetic and our sympathetic nervous system. You're going to have neurotransmitters that come in from the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, and what they're going to affect they're going to affect these HCN channels. 
So the way you slow down your heart rate is you decrease the slope of that pacemaker potential. Instead of it having this kind of slope, it flattens out and it's going to take longer to reach that depolarization stage. So it's going to slow your heart rate. For the sympathetic nervous system, you're going to take that normal pacemaker potential and make that slope even steeper and that's going to cause that to reach your diastolic depolarization faster. And that's all the nervous system does is just changes the slope of those HCN channels. That's it. And that's how you increase or decrease the rate. Whew, it's going to be straight up. Yeah. Because your heart's going to race quickly. Yeah. So again, here we are, autonomic nervous system, right? This is going to be controlled here in the brain stem. That's why if you get a neck injury, you hope it's not too high up. I mean, you can be paralyzed, but if it's too high up in your body, this is where we're going to get into our respiratory center and our cardiac control center. So you're not going to be breathing. You're going to be on a ventilator. And uh, you may be on a heart-lung machine. I don't know how long you can really live on those things because you're not really living at that point. Uh, most of the time, if you damage it that high, it's just game over. During hyperpolarization, the potassium is coming out, right? Not in. Hyperpolarization, you've got sodium coming in and a little bit of potassium going out. But it's the huge amount of sodium coming in that leads to that more positive movement. I'm thinking on the way down. Yeah. Oh, yeah, potassium coming down, the repolarization. Yes, that's potassium. Oh, re -re repolarization. Re yeah. So we have in our cardiac center, we've got the inhibitory center. And if we're wanting to slow down our heart rate, is that fight or flight or is that rest and digest? That's rest and digest. That's our parasympathetic side. And so in our parasympathetic nervous system, we have the vagus nerve that goes everywhere. That's going to come in. It's going to innervate primarily this, the SA node, but it's also going to affect the AV. Again, going to decrease the slope of those HCN channels and slow down our heart rate. And guess what the sympathetic is going to do? The opposite. The opposite. Our sympathetic nervous system in those fight or flight emergencies, that's going to come in the cardio acceleratory center. It's going to speed up. And this is where our nerves from our thoracolumbar Remember, that's sympathetic. Para is cranial, sacral. So we're going to have these nerves coming in to the SA node, AV node. That's going to increase the slope of our pacemaker potential. And it's going to speed up our heartbeat because we're about to do something really active. Uh, what were the baroreceptors and the chemoreceptors again? So that, that really is going to be about pressure, that's going to be about different components of your blood. We're not, we're not focusing on that right now. Okay. okay. Yeah, we're not going to focus on that. That's sort of some more of the physiology of how these things all come together, and we're, we're, not, going to, we're not going to get to those. Okay. All right? All right, so we talked about the action potential in our SA node cells. Now let's talk about the action potential in just our cardiac muscle because it's different as well. So in our cardiac muscle cells, we do have voltage-gated potassium channels. We've got voltage-gated calcium channels. We're going to play with the, the calcium channels again. It's different, and we're going to have sodium voltage-gated channels. So we're at resting membrane potential. It's around minus 90 for our normal contractile cardiac muscle cells. To depolarize, we have to open our voltage-gated sodium channels. I haven't read anything else to say it's not minus 55, but we're not going to worry about where that threshold is. But to get depolarization, we're playing with our sodium channels just like we saw with our neurons. Here we're going to have depolarization that's going to move up to positive 30. Again, pretty much what we saw in our neurons. But here's the different part. 
we're not going to have a straight up and down spike like we saw with our neurons. With our cardiac muscle cells, we're going to have a plateau, a shelf time period that's going to give rise to a much slower and longer lasting contraction. Because we don't need really fast contractions. Our heart just needs to squeeze the blood upward so it's a little bit longer lasting. So to get this plateau for repolarization, we're absolutely going to have voltage-gated potassium just like we saw. But if we just had sodium channels and potassium, it would be straight up and straight down. But what we have opening at the same time are slow voltage-gated calcium channels. Potassium is going out to make the membrane more negative. But calcium is highest on the outside of the cell like sodium. So we've got about an equal amount of these positive ions going in and out. That gives rise to us not getting more positive or more negative. It's just a shelf, a plateau. And that's going to extend the repolarization. But the calcium channels close first. And when the calcium channels close with the potassium channel still open, then we're going to go from a shelf, we're, we're going to fall off the cliff, boom, and we're going to repolarize quickly and get back to minus 90. We're not going to see so much of a hyperpolarization with our cardiac muscle cells, and it may be that longer plateau helps us not go quite as far past minus 90 before we have to do it again. But if we put this into our graphical form, this is what it looks like. Now again, I don't like this illustration because it doesn't really show you what's going on. Here we are, resting membrane potential, depolarization, voltage-gated sodium ions. This makes it look like calcium is open here, calcium channels and then potassium channels open there. No. At this point, your calcium opens first. You see how it's coming down really fast there in the beginning? So potassium opens here. It's open all this time. But about this point, the calcium opens and it starts to plateau. Do you see how it's got that shoulder? And then potass uh, calcium channels close and whew, we fall off. And then the potassium closes and we're back to resting membrane potential. So again, the ramification of that is we get a more slow, longer lasting contraction of the muscle and still that twitch that we're used to seeing with our skeletal muscle.